welcome, ladies and gentlemen, here at the University Future Festival from the main stage in Berlin. And we keep on going here with our next keynote. And we now come to a keynote that has to do with one of the big topics here at the festival. And I bet one of the first thoughts that came to your mind when Chat GDP came up last winter was, what does that mean for academic writing? What will change? How can we use AI? And is this really the end of the term paper? Das Ende der Hausarbeit, as the FAZ newspaper titled. And we are very pleased that Andrea Scott is taking a look at this topic for us. She is currently serving as a research associate of the Center of, uh, for Teaching and Learning at the European University of Viadrina and as an associate professor and director of college writing at Pizza College. Very welcome, Andrea Scott. I forgot to say, you may ask questions here in the chat. So afterwards, we have time for a Q&A. So if you have a question, just put them in the, in the chat. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here. I consider Berlin a second home, originally from, from San Diego. Um, and I'm delighted to talk today about the future of academic writing and its instruction in the age of artificial intelligence. This is a question that my field is talking about um, quite a lot. Um, and so it's particularly exciting to have this platform um, to engage in conversation um, with, with all of you. Um, I, I want to start uh, by doing something perhaps a bit unconventional. Uh, it's just to start by positioning myself uh, with, within this field and with, within this 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 discourse, uh, because as Saga just mentioned, as, as her goal to introduce us all to the um, social entrepreneurship as a, a useful category for thinking about uh, transformation uh, at the universities, I, I, I want to introduce the lens of writing studies as a particularly interesting uh, and an important way to think about uh, the future um, of teaching and learning um, at, at German universities. So. Uh, I started, um, my training is in uh, comparative literature, so I'm a comparatist by training. I started at the University of Chicago, um, where I, which is a theory powerhouse, as many of you know, um, but they also have a writing program that's quite, uh, quite famous and is humbly named the Little Red Schoolhouse uh, on purpose. Um, and um, to me, that was a transformative experience as someone who's the only immediate member of my family to have earned a college degree and the, the only one in my extended family with a terminal degree. This opened up for me the world of academic discourse, so things that I had inherently understood to be true about how academic discourse and knowledge production works. Suddenly I was in a community of folks who really thought explicitly about um, how arguments are formed and made and, and disseminated, and, and for me it was a, a transformational part of my education. And so as I went on with my traditional studies of, of literature, um, I also started to study uh, on my own at that point, uh, rhetoric and, and writing, which is a field in the US, which is well established with 50 years of research, um, and is a new and emerging field here uh, here in Germany as well. So I taught at the New York University, at University of Chicago. Uh, one of my first classes was t uh, teaching writing with, with Daniel Allen, who many of you may know as a political theorist. Um, uh, worked at the New School while I was an exchange scholar at Columbia. And then after I graduated, I had a postdoc at uh, Princeton University, uh, w where I really started to think that writing studies wanted, to, I, I wanted to make that, that a career. Uh, and from there, I went on to become a, a tenure track assistant professor uh, at the Claremont Colleges uh, in, in Southern California, um, uh, and uh, earned tenure, and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, and I'm now situated at the Center for Teaching and Learning at U European University of Viadrina. And I mentioned this. Um, because I think we've talked a lot. A number of the different talks that we've heard today have touched on different different aspects of, of uh, the potential of digital literacies and competencies uh, at, at universities. Um, and my field, writing studies, thinks about writing as a social practice, uh, which means thinking about, about language and, and literacy as social practices with the teaching of writing as a, as a very important subfield. And, Participation, student participation, is at the heart of this of this uh, this enterprise. As is inclusive teaching, right? Because writing remains the key way in which knowledge is disseminated in the various fields. And when we teach writing, we really welcome 
students into the academic community and we mentor them um, to become full participants um, in that community. And so there's a, there's a strong um, um, principle of, of, of equity at work in the teaching of writing that the field has thought a lot about. And um, with the new challenges of, of KI, I think a lot of what the field has already developed, I, I think what I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you now is something that you've heard repeatedly in different talks that I don't have have answers, but I have a solid grasp of what the field understands now um, and um, things that we might need to think about or questions we might need to ask as we think about how to incorporate or not incorporate uh, uh, AI tools uh, in, in, the, in the teaching the teaching of writing. Um, so that was a, 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 long, a long introduction, but I think it's important to, to understand uh, where folks are coming from in, 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 uh, in their disciplinary grounding and in, in, in thinking about academic writing. I'm less on the technical side and more, more on the, the teaching side, um, and uh, also thinking about uh, academic writing, writing more broadly uh, as, uh, a form of uh, as, as a mode of communication that depends on disruption, right? An understanding of, of norms and conventions, um, but we can only say something new in the context of the old. And so I'm hoping my talk will do a bit of both of that. So when ChatGPT first entered the news, of course there was a lot of uh, alarmist <laughs> headlines, right? Um, and we we heard things like, "Is the college essay uh, dead?" For example, is this this end of the house arbeit? Right? How can we how can we change our teaching or our testing practices to prevent cheating. And as Robert mentioned yesterday, this conveys a, 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 very, a deficit understanding of our students and their motives <laughs> for learning. Um, and is also a very uh, narrow perspective through which uh, to think about, uh, think about, um, about teaching. And one of the early anxieties was one that I certainly experienced, and, and I know Robert touched on this as well, is that the first iteration of chat GPT sounded like bullshit, right? In, in the sense of, of Harry Frankfurt, where he says, the liar is purposely deceitful. The bullshitter actually doesn't care if he or she is telling the truth or not, right? And his argument is that the bullshitter is more dangerous because truth doesn't matter, right? And so I think this is part of what touched a nerve in the public discourse and also at universities that are deeply invested in, in the truth, right? And in transparency and one's sources and how one arrives at one's arguments, that suddenly there was a tool that could produce competent academic prose, right? And now it, it, it's gotten much, much better. I, I, uh, folks are saying that actually this uh, chat GPT will soon be able to write impeccably in this style <laughs> of, you know, as recline at the New York Times, right? Um, it, it, we, we're concerned about this because we're concerned about also disinformation, right? Which is a, a, a core challenge of our time and something that we're thinking about at universities preparing our students um, to make sense of, of a world in the age of, of, of disinformation. So um, what I want to do now is uh, to um, to, to say what I'm not doing is talking about writing studies in Germany. Uh, my colleague Doris will be talking about uh, the Virtuales Kompetenz Zentrum uh, in, in a moment, uh, which is doing really important work, um, as is the Gesellschaft für um, Schreibdidaktik und Schreibforschung. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the writing studies in the U.S. and some, some principles that might be, that might be useful here. Um, one is... Um, the conversation has shifted now to, to really talking about teaching and its meaning and, and what do we want our students to learn, right? Why, wh what do we want them to, to leave our class with? How do we want to engage them uh, in, in, in meaningful, meaningful work? Um, and so that's part of my goal too is to say no panic, right, in the era of chat GTP, but rather to think about what are some theories from writing studies, um, which is now a transnational field, um, new in Germany, 50 years in the US. What are some things that might might help us uh, uh, think about writing in the age of um, artificial intelligence. So one is, um, I, I want to say uh, that uh, the, the, we don't know a lot. And um, the, 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 uh, the Association for Writing Across the Curriculum has said, actually, we, we don't um, we can't even recommend whether you should use these tools or not, but we, we have questions that we need to ask, right? Can, can using these tools foster growth? Um, are there scenarios, you know, where we could write, uh, student writing could be complemented or supplemented with AI tools? Can this happen in ways that foster learning? Um, they say, you know, we don't know, but we do know, um, um, we do know that, um, uh, we do know that writing is a tool for learning, and I'll get to that in a moment. And one of the um, 
I see I skipped ahead a bit here. Um, one of the things um, th that th th this group has done is, is, is uh, the, the AWAC has put together a bunch of questions that we need to ask. Um, and I'll let you look at these at your own leisure, um, as I've uh, included a, a link to my, to my slides. Um, but a couple of them, I think they're important because they're questions that we can invite students to also participate in, in answering. Right? This is also student participation, which is a key word, right? So like, how common is the use of AI right now among our students, right? And how heavily promoted are they on TikTok, right? How, how, extensive, um, how expensive are these tools? This is changing constantly. What trends can we observe and student attitudes towards them, right? Policy questions, what, what kind of licensing is there for AI-generated text? This is something that a number of presses are figuring out. These are things that we need to, to learn as teachers, but also things that we can invite our students um, in answering. So we don't know a lot, but we do know a few principles. Um, writing to learn, which means um, writing is a tool for, for thinking. It's not, we don't just do our research and then write up the results afterwards. Um, we know that meaningful assignments are incredibly impactful, and then I think we should embrace something that I'm calling slow teaching. So one is writing to learn is an intellectual activity that can't be replicated by AI. We know that through writing, um, we discover ideas, we refine them. The writing's a tool for learning and it can be used in the surface of disciplinary learning and there are a number of ways that that can happen from brainstorming to exit tickets um, to uh, directed uh, writing prompts. We also know from 50 years of research that meaningful assignments are the number one thing that you can invest in as an instructor. Um, the amount of writing that you assign is not what matters, okay? People thought, oh, you just have to practice, it's like riding a bike, right? That, no, no, that's not true, you can practice in the same mistake and keep reiterating the same mistake, right? You need feedback along the way that less can be best, that actually your assignments are the absolute most important thing that you can do, which directs us to conversations about meaning and what we want our students to learn, and that there are three qualities of effective um, assignments, um, and the qualities are they should be, the, the writing process should be interactive, right? It's, writing is a social practice, right? It doesn't happen uh, in, in a vacuum. Um, that we need to have writing assignments that ask students to make meaning, and we need to be really clear about our expectations, also about why we're asking students to write when theoretically ChatGPT could write the essays for them in many, in many contexts, right? And so, um, so what does this specifically mean in the, in the context of research? Um, this is a it really it comes from a really great study with a, a huge, a huge corpus of, of writing. Um, over 30,000 first-year student essays and responses, 40,000 fourth-year students, um, and they found that that the first principle of a meaningful assignment is an interactive writing process, which means you get people talking to each other, right? That you assigned a draft. That's, I tell folks, if there's one thing you want to do to improve student writing, it would be to set a deadline and have students write drafts <laughs> and then build in opportunities for them to get feedback from each other. Um, what's interesting is that students are, are often doing this themselves. <laughs> and you know, they're asking their parents <laughs> to read their papers or their roommates. Um, um, and one could even experiment with building that into an assignment, uh, an assignment prompt as an option. We also want to acknowledge that students don't have the same levels of, of social capital. Um, but it means, yeah, uh, creating time for students to, to talk with each other and talk through their ideas and, and, and get, get feedback from, from one another and also um, um, possibly from writing tutors, which are at most universities. And I think many of us have found ways to do this, both digitally uh, and in purpose, thinking about Neil's um, recommendation that we make the on-campus experience like a concert, right? Something that people want to go. Students are really eager to talk about each other's work, right? So one version of the flipped classroom that writing instructors have been doing for a long time is peer review assigning a draft to be read uh, ahead of time, right? And then having students use the full time in, in, in class um, to talk about the writing um, and um, to offer each other feedback on how to make the argument better. Um, Another one is that the, 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 the task should be meaning making, right? So not just summary, right? Which uh, ChatGPT is, is really, really good at doing, um, but having students do integrative, creative, and original, original thinking. Um, and even summary is something that we do in the service of something else. No summary is simply objective. Our summaries of other sources lead us down paths of inquiry that, that open up new modes of thinking. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so I've given some, some 
a list of some ways of doing that, applying a concept that's learned, you know, um, relating knowledge learned in one context to another, um, supporting a contestable claim, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another really, and having clear expectations, right? Being very clear about why is it that we're doing what we're doing? Why, why are we writing something, something together? And making that experience social, right? As Robert mentioned yesterday with experiential learning, creating a business plan for a company about how to reduce the carbon <laughs> imprint, right? Like that, that these projects emerge in conversation with both the scholarship, but also partners and students um, in the class. Um, and yeah, being really clear about what we want our students to learn from the assignments um, and, and how they can go about completing them. Another really important study in the US is something called the Meaningful Writing Project, um, which is also a cross-institutional, private and public, um, small and large university, um, based on a lot of, uh, a lot of data. Um, and some of the, basically the takeaways, uh, the takeaways of this study are that meaningful writing happens when we ask students to tap into the power of personal connection. So we're getting back to the social here, right? So they're able to bring their personal interest to bear on whatever it is they're reading. Um, when students are able to immerse themselves in what they are thinking, writing, and researching, right? Actually, these these BA theses are things that students have returned to citing again and again as the single most meaningful thing that they've done because it constitutes integrative um, learning and immersive learning. And that students should be able to often find writing meaningful when they think that they can apply it to their own lives and their own future sense of selves, right? Um, so. Um, so I think this gives us a template for thinking about how to develop student-centered um, assignments and things that will really our students will find um, will find meaningful um, and engaging and connected to work that they they want to do. Um, and this brings me back to our, the sort of the question at the beginning of the talk, right, about what sort of, what's the future of academic writing um, and its uh, instruction. Um, and I think it's easy to get overwhelmed when we think about uh, chat GPT or artificial intelligence and the proliferation of tools that are um, available out there, just as many of us felt overwhelmed during Corona and we're uh, making a digital, a digital transformation in our own teaching. And so I, I want to introduce this concept of small, which might seem counterintuitive, right, in the age of big data, where things are faster and we're encouraged to be agile and so on. Um, because I think, um, uh, you know, I'm inspired by books like The Slow Professor or Generous Thinking by Kathleen Fitzgerald, um, where we are really thinking about um, small interventions we can make and about sustainability um, and doing less, right? Doing more with less. Um, I'm thinking about the talk about how we, the public university is designed for the normative student, right? That, that is not working part time, right? How much time do our students have to work on their assignments? Can we create deep learner, learning with, with possibly less? I think we need to change our pedagogies to also respond to respond to to student um, interests, and and that might make teaching also uh, in some ways more sustainable for us. And this concept of small teaching really means you don't completely change the way you're teaching. Uh, writing to students in the discipline in the age of ChatGPT. Rather, you think about what are some a few small changes that I can make and build on incrementally um, over time. And the idea is that you can actually have a huge impact on learning if you change small things. Um, and, and that you think about, when you think about change, you think about um, basing pedagogy on principles as opposed to on a recipe, right? A recipe for how to teach um, writing, for example. Um, so, um, so with that, I want to leave you with a few principles um, for thinking about teaching academic writing in the age of artificial intelligence. This comes from Anna Mills, who's curated a number of resources and, um, for the writing studies community. Um, and in an article she wrote for the Chronicle of Higher Education, she says, you know, we can't out-prompt, <laughs> you know, chat GPT, right? It, it, it will get better. Uh, we can't count on always detecting it, right? There's software in the US, turn it in. Uh, it it it's always makes mistakes and then it, it, it can't catch up. And also this is based on this deficit understanding of teaching that most of us don't want to embrace 
Anyways, um, however, we can focus on some principles that I think are manageable, right? When we think about how can I integrate these principles into my, my own teaching. Um, and one is um, things that I've been talking about earlier, right? Focusing on motivation and the writing process itself, right? Are we assigning writing that's interesting, uh, as interesting and meaningful to students as possible, right? Are we communicating to students about what makes the process of writing valuable? Are we supporting the writing process, right? Is it something that happens off stage? Are we cultivating a culture of high expectations and high support, right? Where the teaching of writing is now an explicit part of the seminar and the work that we do in mentoring students? Um, and are we focusing on building relationships with our students and also relationships student to student? And peer review here can be particularly powerful. Um, and the other flip side of it is really thinking about what is the nature and the risks of AI and thinking about that with students and developing answers um, together, right? Um, and that is going to depend on us all starting before we feel ready to engage with, with AI, right? Um, and also knowing that we're going to likely get an emotional response from students that's quite strong. Robert mentioned this too, how we anthropomorphize um, technology. Um, and we need to also, and I think this is important, teach our students to be on the lookout for a, a authoritative gibberish or bullshit, right, everywhere <laughs> as, as, um, as part of our project, which opens up questions of information um, literacy, um, and uh, to explore together with our students AI policy and societal impacts with students. So that's a lot, right? When you think about, oh, how, do I, how would I integrate that <laughs> into my, my thinking about, about teaching and learning um, at the university? And the, the, the concept of small teaching would say, don't do it all at once. Um, pick, pick, look at the principles and think about how the principles are already integrated into what you do. How can you foreground that more? And maybe what one or two or three small changes could you make in your teaching practices um, this semester to, um, to begin to prepare students um, to write well in the age of artificial intelligence? And I want to end by just saying that's something that we at the University, um, the European University of Adrena are doing through our small teaching series. Um, where we're inviting faculty to participate in just one hour conversations to keep it small and keep it short and to focus on different themes and to think together about some principles, right, that make sense in how we teach academic communication to students and um, reflect on what we might change um, moving forward. So with that, um, if I were to be a right to learn <laughs> professor, I would have you all do a little writing exercise. Um, but instead of doing that, if you're watching from home, uh, maybe eventually by a video, you can press pause <laughs> and write about maybe one thing you've learned from this, uh, this, this conversation and one question you still have. And with that, I will end my presentation and also give you a link to the slides in case you'd like to linger uh, a bit more uh, with some of the sources that I've cited today. So I hope I've given you some small thing to think about and incorporate uh, into your own practices. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrea Scott. Really interesting. Uh, I bet you have a lot of questions. Uh, you can post them here in the chat if you want to, and Andrea Scott will be happy to answer them. We have plenty of time left. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have the first question already. Um, maybe we need assignment engineering too, not just prompts. What do you say to that? Yeah, so uh, assignment engineering and... Um, yeah, I, I like to think about some of the models that I've given you as a way of thinking about assignment engineering from a pedagogical perspective. So I think this framework of meaningful assignments is really powerful and constitutes a, a student-centered student approach uh, to teaching um, because it asks us um, to think about, also when we think about inclusivity, are we designing our assignments so that students can bring their particular experiences and interests and passions to bear on the kind of work that we're asking them to produce by the semester's end. Um, and the model by Anson and so on about what constitutes um, a meaningful assignment that it's, in, that it's, that it's, you know, that it's interactive, uh, that we're asking students to do tasks that are truly meaningful and authentic to disciplinary thinking in the field. 
um, and that we're being really clear about our expectations and why we're assigning what we're assigning. Like, I feel like those are ways to pedagogically um, engineer our assignments um, so that um, students are engaged in the intellectual <laughs> enterprise in which we're all so invested. Thank you. <laughs> we have one more question. Uh, could AI positively support writing, e.g. writing autopilot? Yeah, I think KI has already been supporting writing. I mean, I think about Grammarly in the United States, which is an auto-completion software um, that was initially developed for international, uh, for L2 writers, um, but is often used by writers with learning differences. Um, it can be incredibly helpful. And, and I think that, you know, the next iteration of Microsoft Office and Google Drive will have uh, AI components um, integrated into them. So I think it's not a question of if, but when. Um, and even now, I notice for myself as someone, I just discovered Deeple three months into my stay in Germany. Now I've been here for a year, right? And that's shifted for me the process of writing, right? In, in German, I'm like, oh my gosh. In a way, it's made me lazy. I'm like, will I ever learn German really well? Um, I think I have, but whatever. Um, but but it's, it's changed the writing process to me to being more about, about editing, right? But in order to edit and to know that Deeple to produce something that's weird, I have to have a deep fundamental understanding of how language works as a social practice, right? Why particularly? So, so yeah, it's not a matter of when, but if. Um, and, um, and I think we need to embrace that stance of um, critical curiosity that was also a refrain yesterday. Uh, in our work as teachers and also in our work as learners and users of, of these tools. Okay, we have one more question, or it's more a thought that I uh, want to give to you. The pace of self-optimization of GPT is so fast. It passes lots of exams. It will write excellent essays or a thesis. Maybe only genuine content counts someday as human. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that that's um, I think that's a really interesting an interesting um, comment, and I think that's part of what's so unsettling about this this technology uh, is that we know right that it it takes about ten thousand hours to develop <laughs> expertise in anything, um, and that uh, artificial intelligence is able to produce plausible prose almost instantly, and there's something about that that feels deeply um, deeply un unsettling. I think this is why it's interesting to talk with students about that. I've done that as a teacher to have students run their own uh, the essay prompt <laughs> and, the, and the, their own text through these AI systems um, to see what comes out and um, to reflect on what is being produced and why it sounds familiar or why it sounds, uh, sounds competent. I, I, I do think you know, there's a saying in the US press that, you know, you don't need to worry about your job being replaced by AI. Your job will be replaced by somebody who knows how to use AI. <laughs> and that's a really interesting distinction, right? Because the program can already perform the competent work of many lawyers in some genres. Um, but how that will transform, a, transform the workplace, that's why I'm excited about social entrepreneurship, like those are, those are really important social questions is that, that we ought to be engaging in at the, uni the university and um, where we need to think too about um, regulation <laughs> and uh, slowing down some of these technologies is why I'm really interested in slow process movements and small right now as a, uh, as a, as a counter response um, because we know we know too that when work is outsourced, um, the folks who lose their jobs don't tend to get better ones, <laughs> right? Even though we think about that. So there's, it's, it's huge. This is, this is one of those wicked problems <laughs> that requires um, interdisciplinary thinking from, from universities and um, what does it mean to even <laughs> generate content? I don't have a good answer, right? I just, I, I just know that this is something that we need to invite students uh, to be part of the conversation of and be, to be holding institutionally at universities um, uh, because it has so much transformational potential, right? Good and bad, yeah. Okay, one last question. How can we convince students that learning to write is important? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I, I think, 
part of it is, um, uh, yeah, first of all, I, I think just writing remains the ways in which disciplinary knowledge is communicated and disseminated. Um, but also writing is fundamental to how we learn, right? So we heard yesterday students interested in, in lifelong learning and that being a part of the university um, education. We don't fully understand things or understand the limits of our thinking until we begin to put it into writing, right? We don't just simply do research and then write up the results. Um, and so writing is this chance to um, engage in this sort of paradoxical, deeply human activity, which is to think about what, what is my argument, what is my stance on this, right, which no one else can do for you, right, um, in the context of what's already been said, right? And, and, and there's an ethics to making visible the scholarly conversation. There's an ethics to citation, right? Um, and in the era of student activism and in this call for inclusion that we heard about yesterday, too, like we, we're deeply invested in making transparent, right? Who's speaking, but also who's not speaking, right? <laughs> As a venue for our students to come in and sort of complete the scholarly conversation. So I think writing is this chance where we have this incredible opportunity to disrupt, right? To understand what is the status quo and to really come to terms with it. Um, but then to say not quite, right? Ye <laughs> do, right? Like, uh, um, I'm, I'm not quite satisfied with this result and to really come to terms with that um, is, requires a lot of courage. And I think that that's precisely why so many students cite these sort of final assignments as being so meaningful for them because one does develop expertise through that process, that messy, iterative process of coming to terms and the many conversations that one has with other texts and with other scholars and with one's peers uh, to make that piece of writing happen. Right. So. Thank you very much, Andrea. We will spread that. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing all your thoughts with us. Thank you for being here. And I want to switch to German now for those of you who listen. Um, wir machen jetzt eine kurze Pause bis 14.25 Uhr und wenn bei euch jetzt bei Ihnen langsam schon so ein bisschen der Kopf voll ist, es gibt eine Meditationssession auf der Pausenstage, da lohnt es sich mal kurz reinzuschalten. Wir sehen uns dann hier auf der Mainstage wieder um 14.25 Uhr. Bis gleich. <lacht>